Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician hosts, Dr. Tom McGovern and Dr. Chris Stroud. And this is the show where we and our guests will discuss relevant health-related topics and we'll always do it from an authentically Catholic perspective. Now, Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of our friends at CMF Curo. Learn more at mycatholichealthcare.org. Live your Catholic faith in your healthcare with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Returning to Dr. Doctor is pediatric radiologist Dr. Brandon Brown. He's kind of one of those Renaissance guys who knows about a lot of stuff in medicine and outside of it. He's going to talk about how images, he, he's usually looking at images of unborn babies through uh, the abdominal walls of their mothers, how those images can reveal the truth of the human person that modern medicine in the media sometimes tries to hide. Now, this might seem like an odd topic or unusual, although we don't shy away from the unusual here, but in Denver in September of uh, this year, 2022, Brandon gave a talk at the Catholic Medical Association annual meeting in Denver, uh, which was uh, titled Image and Likeness, Media, Morality, and Dignity. So we're going to plumb the depths, depths of his, his brain on this. And in prepping for the show, Chris, you said this reminded you of an interesting story. Yeah, I, I just thought of this, and it was years and years ago, and uh, I was working with a student. I, I don't I think it was a medical student. It might have been a college student interested, and we were in the operating room, and like much of my time, it was spent doing laparoscopy, and that's where we put cameras inside of people, in my case, the pelvis, and look at images of them on a screen. Um, and I remember pointing out the anatomy and, you know, some of the pelvic anatomy and all of the interesting landmarks and this very well-meaning, but yet naive student, she said to me, oh, this is fascinating. Now this patient is African-American. What would it look like in a Caucasian patient? <laughs> and at first I thought she was trying to be funny, but then I realized she actually wondered, would the anatomy be different, different by, you know, nationality and ethnic background and things like that. And in preparing for this show, I think it was a reminder to me of just how important it is maybe to remind ourselves of how same we are. Once you take away all of these superficial layers, you know, now you're a skin guy, you work in those superficial layers. <laughs> I do. You know, as opposed to Brandon, who quite literally looks beyond that, you know, with yes. x-rays and with MRI and with ultrasound, he's literally looking inside the person, you might say, and he doesn't have the ability to see all of the things that, that we tend to use knowingly or unknowingly to form our biases with. You know, he, he can't see if they're tall, if they're short, if they're skinny, if they're fat, what their skin color is, if they're Asian or Middle Eastern. Or, he doesn't have the ability to do that. He doesn't so, even see how well they're dressed. He, right. he doesn't know how smart they are. He doesn't know their yeah. socioeconomic status. There's no cues for that, any of that. Yeah, it's really, I, I've never thought about that with radiology because like you, I enjoy beating up on radiologists as a <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I don't beat up on radiologists. <laughs> don't say like me. <laughs> well, I've, I've spent many hours enjoying beating up on radiologists, mostly out of jealousy for their lifestyle. <laughs> We'll have to talk to Brandon about that when he comes on. Yeah. But, but now I have much more interest because they really are seeing the actual person and not all of those things that just get in the way and cause us trouble sometimes. Well, it reminds me of something. Um, a couple of my young sons are working in the pro-life movement when they can. And one of the things that they brought home to me was the fact that we've got so much diversity training. Why don't we have some commonality training? <laughs> <laughs> and and that makes so much sense to me because when I think about what connects me to somebody else, yes, if there's something different, yeah, viva la difference. It's wonderful that we have differences and that we're not all the same. But the mm -hmm. things that really connect me to other people are what we have in common. We yeah, all suffer. We, yeah, we our likes, it. our dislikes, our hobbies, our our professions, all of those things. You know, what is what's the most common topic of conversation? I would say among adults at a party, our children. That's something sure. we we all share in common, and we like to find yeah we like to find commonality, don't we? Because yes. it, it feels good, it's comfortable, and I think it would do a lot towards society's ills if the news covered things we had in common once in a while instead of things that we have different. 
Yeah, I think it'll be an interesting conversation, most certainly, because their goal in the media, as I know he'll point out, is just the opposite. It, it's by design to point out our differences and any conflict that exists, as they said in the old days, sells newspapers. Right. Um, and so yeah, I think it'll be fascinating to hear what he's got to offer us about the human image. Yeah, it'll it'll gain clicks too. And but you're right. In my specific field of skin cancer, that top millimeter, actually less than a millimeter, makes a huge difference in what happens uh, below and uh, provides for my uh, <laughs> my lifestyle. Um, you know, it does oh. amaze me, though. Even as many years as as I've been doing this and you've been doing this, the minute I walk into an exam room, I'm consciously and unconsciously sizing up the patient. You know, how are they dressed? Are their children well behaved? Um, you know, you know, are they well kept or are they sort of dishuffled? And I, it's, I think it's part of the human nature. We yes. want to do that. We want to catalog and get as much data as we can. Unfortunately, that data sometimes can lead us down the wrong path. But it's kind of neat. Like when I look under a microscope, I can't tell one patient from another. You know, they all look the same. I mean, they're just a little bit more pigment, but you have to kind of look for it, uh, even if they're darker skinned. Uh, yeah. so I guess like Brandon, they all look the same and, you know, all those other things fall away, which I think is kind of neat. Um, it is. yeah. When, yeah. When I go in the exam room, I try to treat all my patients equally well, regardless of how they look, act, you know, how engaged they are or not. I, they just deserve it. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're human people and that's what we're going to talk about. We are. And, uh, I'm sure that Brandon will wax eloquently with uh, his great knowledge of philosophy, ethics, and literature. But you know, but, people would be sorely disappointed if we didn't get to our medical trivia question of the day, because you know they've tuned in just to hear that. Uh, no, but we'll still do it anyway. <laughs> so today's category, because it deals with Brandon, are prenatal radiology tests. Uh, so the most, the most commonly used radiology tests for pregnant women and their unborn babies are ultrasound, and MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. What do these two tests have in common that make them the preferred tests for pregnant women? Hmm. I think you know the answer, but you're not going to spill the beans. We're yep. going to wait till the end of the show. Uh, hopefully this is one you can get. Uh, I felt generous today. Uh, but after the break here on Dr. Doctor, we'll be back with Dr. Brandon Brown, Image and Likeness, Media, Morality, and Dignity. And we're back with our guest, Dr. Brandon Brown. Brandon is currently at uh, Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis. He uh, teaches at the IU School of Medicine. He's a pediatric and fetal radiologist who got his uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Dallas in political philosophy and then an unusual combination degree. Often you hear MD, PhD. He got MD in philosophy at IU. Uh, he did fellowships in pediatric radiology and interventional radiology. He doesn't use the second one. He uses a form one. Brandon, welcome back to Dr. Doctor. Thank you so much. It always is such a pleasure for me to uh, join you and uh, have these great conversations. Good. Well, you're going to expand our brains here. I just sense it. So <laughs> at the Denver 2022 CMA Annual Education Conference, you gave a presentation, Image and Likeness, Media Morality and Dignity. What was the main take-home point you wanted for the doctors there to get from that presentation? Well, you know, the the impetus for the topic was really um, a starting point that I think is is something that's really important to Christians today, and I think it's good, and that is we want to stand up for the existence, for the possibility of truth. You know, we're tired of being told that everything is completely relative uh, to the individual experience and there's nothing firm we can hold on to. You know, reality is elusive. We're pushing back. We're saying there is a truth. In fact, truth has a name. It's Jesus Christ. And uh, because of that, we've really emphasized in our tradition and in our conversations the importance of human thought and rationality and logic, and that these things can be the underpinnings of something firm to hold on to a way of knowing with our limited human minds. That's great. I love that. I support that. And uh, I myself have used that line of uh, argument. However, in my work as a physician, 
uh, at a children's hospital. I've found that if that's all we can say about what makes us human, if that's all that we can say about why we have value, it makes it very challenging to defend the rights of the least among us, the disabled, the those who maybe will never achieve that kind of autonomy that's so idolized today, rationality and self-awareness and all these things. And so I wanted my audience to come away with some other reason, something else that makes us valued and valuable as human beings beyond uh, our rationality. And, and we're going to plumb that and look at how images in society and images that you look at uh, play a role in that or impact that. You know, Brandon, do you think, you know, you spend your life looking at, at, at images of children and infants, even before they're born. It, it seems like there's something magical about children that will allow people sometimes to escape their biases. Um, <laughs> you know, what is, what is so a good point. special about kids that allows us to do that, that it'll take even the hardened, the hardest heart and, and, and bring them to their knees? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I, I, I don't know if I can put my finger on the magic because there is something sort of, um, you know, ephemeral about it. But uh, one idea that I've had before is that we live in a world where everyone is putting on a posture. Everyone has a show, a performance to give. And it, it really leads you as you get older and maybe you have some bad experiences to kind of have this, this crust of cynicism that you wear, this coat of armor that says, I know everyone out here is trying to take something from me. Everybody wants something. And you know, kids, they put us at ease because we don't have that cynicism. We, we expect that they're going to be unvarnished, that they're going to be raw and candid, uh, but also we, we don't have to worry that they're trying to manipulate us in that same way. Yeah. Fascinating. So, Brandon, let, let's start with images in society. How do you think that images in the media steer us away from what is essential about human beings? Well, you know, there's no question that we're immersed in images, as you say, and they're in society, they're in culture, they're in the media, uh, but they're also just... Um, a part of our daily life. We create images all the time, artifacts for ourselves. You know, artists do this and ch you know, children love to create images. <laughs> and uh, now we have, um, you know, every single human being that I work with is walking around with a telephone in their pocket at all times, which has also happens to be a camera, right? So we're constantly creating images. And, um, you know, you might say this is revealing more to us about ourselves and about the world. And I'm sure there are ways that that's true. Uh, but it's also possible that we could be losing sight of what's real through this avalanche of images. And uh, perhaps you've experienced this with movies or television or media of some form or another where the images we see are not necessarily the truth. They're crafted, they're carefully staged, and they are more about uh, a performance, like I was saying earlier, than they are about the truth. And um, sometimes that performance can speak to our biases. In fact, I would say the main goal of advertising is to tap into your biases and get <laughs> some money out of them. <laughs> <laughs> So we have to be a little bit um, skeptical that sometimes more images equals a deeper understanding. It's a little bit like data, right? Sometimes more data gives us more wisdom about ourselves and the world. Uh, but it's also possible that data can distract us from the truth. It can almost um, it can almost obscure more than it reveals. But from a societal standpoint, it almost feels like we're we're addicted to the digital. Mm. You know, we love images. We want to see. We don't just want to hear anymore. We want to see. And of course, to your point, now we can see maybe sometimes too much. Um, and we're not seeing what we think we're seeing. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I, I would also say that um, they allow us, images allow us to project what we want others to affirm about us. So I don't necessarily want the world to see everything about me that I know about me. <laughs> you know, I want to put my best face forward. And um, 
I want to be affirmed in my identity. And we hear a lot about identity these days, mm -hmm. especially now that there's this whole new movement towards questioning the relevance of gender to identity or sexuality to identity, or maybe putting all of our emphasis on sexuality as an identity. Sure. Um, but what's really interesting about that is it's not enough for most people who are deep into that movement um, to feel their identity inside of themselves. They want some, someone external to affirm it. So they project the image that they think will demand that society affirm them. So what you did in your talk, and let's dive into some of that now, is that there are different ways now of looking at the human person and for what gives us dignity. Where, where should we start for our listeners with the topic of what makes a human person moral or gives them dignity? Well, I think most people would start by talking about, uh, you know, their independence. And uh, in America, we love independence and we've greatly <laughs> benefited from it. So I, I can't put myself outside that box. I, I love independence. Um, and more and more, we talk about it in the, in the context of autonomy. Everyone loves autonomy. We use it to describe our rights. We use it to describe the necessity of consent. I am a unique individual and it can't be violated. And that's, you know, that's really what the word sacred means, inviolable. So I'm sacred even. I think a non-religious person might cower from that word a bit, but the truth is we believe it about ourselves. We believe we're sacred. You can't violate my rights. And so this, this autonomy, which has a lot of truth to it, um, can lead us to start to think of ourselves as self-sufficient. Mm. Autonomy and, and self-sufficiency aren't the same, but I think it, they get mixed up in a lot of people's brains. And we love to think of ourselves this way. I did it myself. I'm a self-made human yeah. being. You know, these are compliments. It would be so wonderful if it were true. Um, but as Christians, I think none of us can claim to be self-sufficient. We're all incredibly dependent because we're all creatures. Yeah, and uh, we are not our own creator. Yeah, we've used the phrase on our show before, worshiping at the altar of autonomy. Mm. And the autonomy has sort of become this penultimate sort of goal that everyone should pursue. And we don't really love autonomy. At least I love my autonomy. And I don't <laughs> mind yours until yours gets in the way of mine. Yes. And then I'm not nearly as big a fan of autonomy. Uh, yes. No, that's true. Um, but at the same time, I think that we've lost the ability to define anything further about ourselves that's intrinsic to our human dignity. We say um, in the tradition of some, uh, I guess you might say some philosophers of the second half of the 20th century, most notably Peter Singer from Princeton, um, we say, you know, that uh, autonomy, rationality, and self-awareness are the core features of what give us our human dignity. Mm. And uh, the problem with that is um, there are large quantities of my life where I'm not very rational or self-aware. You know, if you catch me at 2 a.m., <laughs> good luck, you know. And uh, maybe if you're in a coma, it's even longer than just a few hours at night and maybe uh, if you're a, a severely um, you know, neurologically disabled human being, it could be your entire life. You know, there are people among us who never have and never will achieve self-awareness or rationality. And so the question that came to me uh, recurrently as I take care of some of these patients uh, at our children's hospital, the radiologists handle a lot of the feeding tubes. So you might imagine the more disabled patients frequently require um, percutaneous feeding tubes for their nutrition. And a lot of these patients never know what I'm doing, can't talk to me, don't even know that I exist really. Um, and how can I argue or believe or respect that they have dignity and that they have value if I've put all of my uh, hopes on uh, these things that they won't demonstrate like uh, rationality? Yeah. So then what is the basis for personhood and dignity if it's not these things, unfortunately, these things are what most of modern medicine considers uh, unique to human beings and gives us dignity. Yes, you're right. They are what modern medicine considers. And I think part of the problem is um, we tend to emphasize the things um, that we can count, you know, and ah. uh, 
the things that we can measure. And I always love to remind medical students that even though the brain death criteria, if you're evaluating a patient um, in a sad scenario in the ICU, let's say, who's who's suspected to no longer have any brain function, um, you test all these reflexes, including putting cold water in the external auditory canal, and then their eyes are supposed to move in a very predictable fashion. Uh, we don't test that because we think that cold water response is part of the you know core of what makes us human. We we measure it because it's easy to measure, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> we we can really get pretty obsessive about um, trying to find things that uh, that are easy to count. And um, I would suggest that the truth of our of our situation as human beings. Uh, as creatures is that we're defined by our relationships. First of all, we're defined by a relationship to a creator. And uh, then throughout our lives, we're defined by the relationships to other human beings that we have first as a child and maybe a sibling. And then later in life as a friend, as a brother, as a sister, as a mother, as a father ourselves. And uh, all of our tethering to the world and to society is through the context of relationships. And uh, it may be that our descendants from each other is uh, a pretty critical aspect of who we are. So if it's relationships, how would that apply to somebody... John Paul II, his whole family died. His relations, relations, human relations were gone. Yes, right. And there are many people in our world who feel very alone, very cut off. They can't look around them and see the visible reminders of those relationships. But, you know, if you, it's interesting. If you look back in human history, many cultures spent a lot of time carefully maintaining records of generational ancestry. And even sacred scripture spends sometimes a pretty long time. You might even say a, a tedious amount of time going through. Yeah, right. And such and such was the son of such and such was the, right. you know, and it's on and on. Um, and you might read through that and think, why are we doing this? On the other hand, what a powerful reminder uh, of where you've come from and the ways in which you're linked, not just the people that you can see, or the people whose names you know, but to a really long line that extends farther than your own comprehension. Yeah, and I think anyone who has uh, a disabled child in the family or even a disabled adult in the family realizes that those people still have relationships and impact others, even in the height of their disability. Maybe they lack the ability to speak or, or even interact, and yet somehow they still impact the, their loved ones. Um, and unfortunately, I guess, most of our listeners would never have a chance to see that, um, but it is a powerful thing to see that happen. So Brandon, if you're taking care of somebody in the hospital, putting in a gastrostomy tube, and somebody in the hospital says, why do you keep doing this, Brandon? Why don't you just let him die? How would you respond? Or how have you responded if that came up? <laughs> well, thankfully, no one's been quite that, um, I would say, uh, glib about the disposability of human life, although we certainly see glimpses of it in, in the world around us. I think that there's a really significant role in the physician's work, in the physician's life, that involves affection. And I don't mean romantic love. I don't mean uh, the kind of thing that would make you want to ask someone on a date, but I do mean that the work that we do can't be merely transactional. Anyone who thinks of their job as transactional isn't going to survive very long because as we all know, medicine involves some pretty emotionally challenging scenarios, some pretty heart-rending scenarios, and it, it can drain you. And um, there's also some aspects of it that are pretty physically uh, challenging and uh, exhausting. Everyone's familiar with the hard work it takes to, to get through medical training. Uh, and I think that maybe sometimes people lose sight of the, the reason they got called to medicine in the first place. And I really do use that word calling intentionally. I don't think it's just, um, you know, I perform a service and I'm looking for compensation. There has to be more to it than that. And the people who lose sight of the greater story 
in which they need to situate their lives. You know, what's the bigger story that I'm a part of? They're the ones who are talking about burnout. They're the ones who are talking about moral injury and work-related stress because uh, the transactional nature of a, just a simple exchange of you know fees and services uh, is not really why we're here. So when I look at that patient, that that person who can't thank me, who doesn't even know what I did, and uh, will never contribute to the GDP of the United States of America, I have to ask myself, um, why do I do it? As you say, and then secondly, um, what a, a, am I able to share in common with this person. I think the more I think of myself as different from the people I take care of, the less empathy and compassion I summon for them. And the more I see myself as the same as them, uh, the more I can really do my job well. And so it comes back to me from that idea of descendants and interestingly, um, also dependence. So not autonomy, but rather the fact that they are in need of care and affection and human touch and and all of these things but you know so am i mm -hmm. and um if you ever spend time with uh the disabled especially the uh, neurologically disabled you realize quite quickly um that there's much less of this posturing going on that we see so much today in our relationships and social media. They're very raw and unfiltered. If you spend time, for example, maybe with um, you know, patients with trisomy 21, they will be very upfront about what they're doing and who, they're, who they are and, and why they want to be with you. And a lot of times they'll be very honest about this fundamental human question. You know, do you love me? Do you accept me? Do you care about me? And I think it's a question that all of us are going through life asking again and again, but it's embarrassing to show that kind of vulnerability. So a lot, a lot of the time we, we spend time disguising that, hiding it, pretending that we don't need love or relationships or affection. And when we spend time with those who aren't cynical, who aren't putting on that performance, we're reminded of just how much like that we all are. And Brandon, yeah, are we you, truly... Reminded just as recently as Monday of this week um, in surgery, when the case was over and the patient now is completely exposed, mm. um, uh, I see this happen all of the time. Um, the well-meaning nurse who's really engaged will just ever so quietly recover the patient. Mm. Uh, but the patient's asleep. She has no idea of any of this, but yet there's some unspoken thing in the room that says this person has dignity, they deserve to be covered up because that protects one's dignity to, to a degree, even though no one would know. You know, it would be, you could argue, well, that's a waste of activity, but it really isn't because I think we all have that sense of, well, that could be me, uh, or that could be my grandmother, or that could be my child. Um, and so they deserve to be treated, you know, with some respect. Yes. And we see them as part of this sort of common human family of which we all exist. You know, Aristotle's famous for saying that um, the human being is the, is the rational animal, and that's in his ethics, the Nicomachean ethics. But if you read his poetics, which I would recommend to anyone, it's a short read, um, he says man is the imitative animal, the mimetic animal, above all other creatures. And uh, literally um, we're images, you know, for in the Christian tradition, we would say we're images of God. And, um, but, but in a, in a kind of a lesser sense, we're also images of each other. And uh, that's <laughs> an important thing to remember because um, we get distracted by all of the superficial in life, whether it's the postures of, of people trying to disguise and hide and evade being, you know, truly seen, or whether it's the disfigurement and deformity and decay of our own mortality. And this is where imaging is really valuable. It strips away a lot of that superficial disguise and it helps. So let's to get to imaging in the second half. I think that's a great lead in. And we're going to take a quick break here on Dr. Doctor and be back with more of Brandon Brown on image and likeness in medicine. We're back on Dr. Doctor with Brandon Brown. And Brandon, we want to dive into now the, your world of imaging and how it helps you to see similarities between people, as you, you said, instead of the differences. So how do images strip away the deceitfulness of the images that we see day in and day out? 
I think that's a great way to phrase it. They do. They, they kind of push aside the superficial and most of our life gets spent dealing with the superficial. And um, we all try to differentiate ourselves in that superficial way. But the truth is on the inside, there's a lot uh, that's common about us and it's hidden. And so I think of my job as a radiologist as revealing the hidden, which is pretty important when you've got uh, a patient who can't fully articulate what's wrong with them, maybe because they're you know, disabled or maybe because they're very young, they're not speaking, maybe they're very old and they're demented. Uh, but we need to reveal what's going on there. That's our job. And we also uh, need to advocate. You know, this is a kind of a, a question of giving a voice to the voiceless. And so I like to think that um, a lot of the, the value of medical imaging is to reveal those things that, that otherwise might be missed. And, uh, and where we miss it the most are the marginalized groups, the peripheries of life, the very young and the very old, like I said. They're the ones who remind us, by the way, of our weakness and our vulnerability. But if you're in the middle of life at full health and full productivity, you don't want to be reminded of vulnerability. You kind of like to pretend like you're going to live forever. Um, and I'm not sure we are at our best or our most virtuous when we're, you know, proudly walking ahead as though we will live forever. It's, it's that reminder of our mortality, of our vulnerability, of our weakness um, that really draws us to the act of service that we're all called to. So give us a patient scenario. Give us a story of this. Your life. Well, you, you know, I deal a lot with uh, the very beginning of life. I call it... Um, fetal medicine. Other people might think of this as perinatal. And it's the, the very sickest pregnancies right before birth, especially, and then after birth. Um, and a lot of these cases are cases that no parents dreamed about when they were dating or first married. <laughs> these are very, you know, these are very uh, complicated pregnancies. And in many cases, very disabled children who aren't even born yet. And these parents didn't ask for that. They asked maybe to be parents, uh, and maybe they asked for a son or a daughter, or they were happy with you know all of the above. But um, they they had something else happen, and that's an amazing thing about human generation. When a, a new life is brought into the world, it's always something that we can't fully control, and and that makes us uncomfortable. Humans love control, but we don't get to control this. And uh, there's a certain degree when you are going to become a parent of openness to a thing that you can't control and that you didn't ask for. You know, there's, um, there's this phrase, openness to the unbidden, which has been used by several moral philosophers of the 20th century who I respect. And I think it's, it's a really interesting thing because that's the reality of life, openness to the unbidden. So much happens to us that we didn't ask for or control, our own existence, our own birth, our own capabilities and personalities, and then that of our children. And so I see a lot of families who come in, they're distressed. They have, um, a, basically in their minds, they have a, a brokenness inside of them. Now, the truth is we all have a brokenness inside of us, right? It's part of the human condition, but they're scared and they don't know what it means. And I spend a lot of time, this is a little bit unusual, I think, but I spend a lot of time sitting down with um, other physicians and the family and just looking at pictures with them. And we spend an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours with every family just going through all of the images of their pregnancy and talking through what there is and what it will mean and um, what we can do to serve and, and maybe even repair uh, this, this not yet born human life. And so it's a really profound experience because the images have this incredibly distilling effect. All of the fears and worries and anxieties, which might be ballooning out of control, or God forbid that you did some Googling and now you're really having out of control fears, uh, we, can, we can bring it all down to some very discrete points. And looking at the images of their pregnancy, looking at their child, seeing it, has this um, incredibly calming effect on so many families. It happens again and again. And, and sometimes I got to be honest with you, I don't always show images of perfect, beautiful human beings. I show images sometimes of disease and, and defect and deformity. And I don't mean to suggest that everyone's happy-go-lucky about the process, far from it, but it allows them 
to start to think not about an idea or a diagnosis, but about a person. Yeah, I was just going to say you establish personhood by imaging it, which is rather unique. You know, the thing that I've experienced as an obstetrician with tough diagnoses in pregnancy is what what feels like this terrible conflict. You know, any mother knows they love their baby before they even see the images. And yet then we do images and we tell them something's wrong. And then she has the world in one voice that's saying, oh, that's too bad. You should probably discard it. But then she's saying, but I love it. Um, and then I think part of the magic of what people like you do is you affirm the love side of that equation by showing this is actually a person inside you with a heart and a smile and a tongue and um, all of those things that makes us a, a person. And I know that it helps them. What, what a remarkable chance you have to sort of step into the, the void there and, and be a louder voice for good. Well, I feel very grateful. Um, you know, we could say negative things about technology, and I'm sure there are many uh, <laughs> dark sides of technology. But one bright side is that um, it really does add a perspective. Um, uh, there's been some discussion, I think, amongst Christians about whether prenatal diagnosis is even a good thing. You know, um, Jerome Lejeune, who was the first president of the Pontifical Academy for Life and made some pretty important contributions to prenatal care, yeah. um, he he struggled a lot with the fact that he uh, defined the chromosomal underpinnings of trisomy 21 and may have led to uh, an easier way to identify and discard these lives. I think he right. felt the burden to show the good that could be done because he also experienced in others the ways this could be abused. And I think all of prenatal diagnosis is the same way. Yes, there's a dark side. When we see something that's, um, that's not convenient in life, there's a temptation to run away from it, to discard it. But also there's a, a response that kind of calls us out of ourselves, not to the comfort of convenience, but to the greatness of, of living out the imitation of Christ. And I think that people, even, you know, who aren't Christian can respond to that. I've seen some remarkable cases where parents have come to me and they've said, we've actually already scheduled our termination. Mm. We know there's a brain problem. Uh, the ultrasound wasn't exactly able to tell us all the details. So we're going to get rid of this pregnancy, you know, later this week, unless you say something that changes our minds. <laughs> no pressure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I man, I'm praying to the Holy spirit a lot in those moments because you know, I want to, I want to do the, the right thing for them and for their child. I want to show them the truth, but I also have um, a deep desire for them to recognize the, the value of that life and their relationship to it. Um, and not just, you know, these questions that people love to rush into, which say your know, quality of life, what's going to be the quality of this life, but to ask ourselves, how can we, through our love, through our care, through our affection, enhance the ability of everyone else around us to live a, a life of love, a life that is loved. So and, Brandon, and have you been able to turn any of those minds around? Well, I don't think I can, but I have seen some remarkable cases where the work that we do has maybe opened some people's eyes and they've been open um, to an idea they weren't originally open to. I've seen some people change their minds. I like How to did think that happen? Uh, what did they see? What did they hear? What did they learn that made a difference? Because you're talking about these images, but can you give our listeners an idea of what is it you're seeing? Well, you know, we're seeing anatomic structures, right? We're seeing uh, in shades of gray, you, you might say. Uh, some people describe an ultrasound to the uninitiated, kind of like looking at a snowstorm. An MRI is a little sharper, a little clearer, but it's still just shadows, right? And um, you have to do some interpretation. So I spend a lot of time narrating for patients. I get up out of my seat. I go up to the, you know, the projector screen and I'm pointing out this and I'm scrolling through and trying to give a sense of what's going on. But ultimately I ask a lot of questions because we bring all of these assumptions about what makes uh, a, a valuable life, what makes a, a, a life that can contribute, what's good. And we bring a lot of certainties and the reality of all of medicine, even the reality of our own life is that we live in a world of uncertainty. 
Mm. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do 10 years from now. And I don't know what my healthy children are going to do 10 years from now, let alone uh, a child who's not uh, fully healthy. And so I ask a lot of the parents what they want, what are their goals in understanding during these sessions? And then I ask them, uh, what do they hope for their child? And it's really important, I think, to look at those images and then to say out loud, what do they hope for their child? Because all of us are bringing these hopes and expectations into scenarios. And when they have to say it out loud, sometimes they're having this conversation with each other for the first time. They're able to start to see it in a slightly different light. So you've seen some parents go from abortion minded to allowing their child to come to, to life outside the womb? I have. Yeah, I have. And I will say that there's a lot of fear um, and I don't blame them a bit. I would be terrified if I were in their shoes and I have been in their shoes, um, you know, with some of my own um, scenarios. I've had uh, cases where my children have required medical care. So uh, the fear is real and they need support. You know, we've spent a lot of time in medicine making sure we're not paternalistic. We don't want to tell patients what to do. We don't want to be bossy, but they need <laughs> someone to stand next to them. To, to help carry the burden, to shoulder this incredible anxiety. And they need us to not just put it all in their lap and say, oh, I'm, you know, I can't make the decision for you. Good luck. You know, here's the data. Here's a randomized control trial, you know, best wishes. Uh, I don't think that's what they need. They need us to, to be there and say, we're going to be here to help you. And we're going to be here to support you. And when you're you know, afraid and thinking of questions late at night, here's how you can contact us. And so a lot of that shared Sharing of the burden, I think, is is really integral to all of this. You know, I had an encounter with a physician not too long ago, and I was trying to make a medical decision. And I said to him what patients say to me all the time, what would you do? You know, what would you do if it were you, if it were your son, your daughter? Yes. And um, the surgeon said, well, I specifically never answer that question because oh. I don't think it's helpful. <laughs> and I thought, well, I specifically need a better physician. Uh, because that, <laughs> that's the kind that? of person I, I want to answer. Wow. I want somebody that can tell me that because that's how we connect, isn't it? That's how yes. we identify. Oh, yeah, you might even... patients is the best question is not what should they do because I, I can tell you, I don't know what your values are, but if you ask me what I would do, that's an easy answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with you on that. So, but, you know, back, back to imaging, especially the unborn, it's, it's, all, it's fascinating that there's something about an image that, defines personhood you know does it it doesn't have to mean four limbs because limbs could be missing you know um there has to be a heartbeat so there has to be some i guess objective sign of life um but there doesn't have to be a completeness structurally but there is something about an image of a baby on ultrasound a real-time ultrasound that i think anybody can look at it and say well that's a human you know um, it's not a puppy. It's not the potential to be a human. It is a human. But that's difficult to do in the generations before us that didn't have people like you with amazing images and that technology. I, I agree. I think that we've gained a lot with the ability to see past the superficial. And uh, that's really what we're trying to do in life. And I think even as Christians, it's so easy to get caught up in this idea that our goal is to, you know, seek joy and avoid suffering. And it really requires a kind of about face to say, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> actually joy and suffering are both on the side of a deep life. And what I want to do is seek depth and avoid superficiality. Uh -huh. So the, the degree to which we can do that with our patients um, and to help them to even experience the trauma and the distress of illness in a deep, meaningful way is, is I think, a, a big contribution we can make. What do you think those of us who aren't in radiology can do in medicine to help reveal what is hidden, Brandon? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I, I, would, I would say that the first thing we can do is not be afraid of our vulnerability, not be like that surgeon that you told us about who said, oh, I don't answer that question. Because that's kind of like saying, I don't want to get my hands dirty. You know, I don't want to stick my neck out that far. Um, because, you know, in order to be a person of trust, there's a certain degree of risk involved. And some of us don't like risk, right? So maybe if I don't, if I don't want to risk anything, then I just can't um, you know, put myself in that vulnerable situation, but that's where our patients are. So if we're going to meet them and help them, we have to allow ourselves to be honest about our own vulnerability with them. That, and that's, well, that's, 
that's connecting over commonality, like you said. If we can be yes. vulnerable with our patients, boy, they're going to trust us more. We're going to help it. That's a great point, Brandon. And that's what imaging does. I mean, I, I don't know if you would feel this way, but I've had people look at a CT scan of, of me from neck all the way down to hips. And um, it's not quite the same as being naked in front of my colleagues, but there is a, <laughs> there's a certain sense that they, there are things being revealed about me. You know, I can't hide uh, from the CT scanner. And um, those images, they really do show us as we truly are and maybe uh, they help us to remember how God sees us. He doesn't see us as proud and put together and got it and taking care of business. He sees us as, you know, creatures. That is you know, that's how I feel when I go through TSA at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the stand up total body x-ray. That's um, right. And they realize that I left my crucifix on and then they're going to go after it, you know. But you do feel in a certain way somewhat, you know, visually violated there. Um, yes, it's true. And, uh, you know, we, we want to respect people's uh, privacy, but um, the truth is that all of us are vulnerable and uh, we all are in many ways brought together by that vulnerability. That's what helps us to remember the community that we're part of. Even if our parents have died, our children have died, we feel cut off and alone. As a human being, we're the member, we're, we're a member of a community and we share in common with every other person we meet that status where we're creatures who have to be open to that posture to life, which allows us to accept things and care for each other. Now, Brandon, it, it, you, don't, you don't sound like most physicians and <laughs> you, certainly don't sound like, you certainly don't sound like most radiologists I've known in 25 years. Um, so I think it'd be fascinating to know what are your interactions like with other physicians um, when, when you're essentially evangelizing to mm. see the real person beyond the superficial? Um, I, I think I try to get people to be more comfortable with words that they're initially afraid of, words like affection and vulnerability and interdependence. Um, one of my jobs, I wear a few different hats here at IU. One of my jobs is um, for IU Health, the Director of Physician Vitality and Values. Wow. And um, it, it's a, it, you said it, it's, and in many ways, it's kind of like evangelizing, <laughs> going out and reminding people of things that they once knew, but maybe they've kind of forgotten that crust of indifference and cynicism uh -huh. has crept in. And so uh, it takes intentionality. In the old days, you bump into people all the time, hang out in the doctor's lounge. Well, <laughs> that's not 2022. You got to be intentional about it. So that's what we're working on. And I, and I believe in the project. So Brandon, what final words of wisdom do you want to leave with our listeners today? Well, I would say that the most important thing that we've been given is our relationships, first uh, with God and then with each other. And all of the core message of Christianity involves caring for those relationships. And so even as physicians, it's tempting to think of ourselves as diagnosticians or therapists or surgeons or, you know, technicians, but ultimately we're practicing at the level of one relationship at a time. So ask yourself, what is my relationship to my patients and to my colleagues, my fellow physicians? Is it the way I want it to be? And if not, what's going to bring me closer in those relationships and work towards that? Wow. Well, Brandon, you've taught us and our listeners a great deal about personhood and what it means to be a human person and why we all deserve dignity. Uh, thank you for sharing yourself with us and thank you for all that you do for, for patients and those around you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the chance to talk. Well, welcome back to Dr. Doctor, and welcome to this episode's Medical Trivia Question Repeated. This one is about, as you might guess, imaging. Yes, prenatal radiology tests. So what is it about the most common radiology tests in pregnancy, ultrasound and magnetic resonant imaging that makes them so popular? I'll let you answer this since this is your Bailey work far more than mine, Bailey Wick. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, Brandon referenced ultrasound a great bit, but both of those uh, technologies give remarkable images, but there's no radiation. Um, there's no x-ray involved. It's all uh, either sound waves or magnetic waves. 
And so there's no damage at all uh, to the tissue. So there's nothing to be concerned about. They're perfectly and completely safe. Right. And so what would, what would a CT scan that uses x-rays, uh, how is that better? Why is it used sometimes instead of these other two? Is there some advantage in some circumstances? Yeah, I know a little in my area. We should have asked Brandon, actually. But, you know, for instance, I like to look at my patient's ovaries a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, the CT scan is terrible for looking at ovaries. It just doesn't work. They're full of fluid. They move around. You mean the um, ultrasound isn't good for it? Ultrasound is perfect, but CT scan is not good at all. Okay. Um, but well, if I wanted to look, you know, maybe at the muscle of the uterus, well, an MRI gives a beautiful picture of that. So it really depends on the type of tissue and the fluid density and composition of the tissue. CT scan is great for bones. MRI is really good for bones. So it really just depends on the kind of tissue. But as you point out with the answer, um, the safety of ultrasound and MRI, particularly when it comes to the unborn, that's really that's really paramount importance. So your top three from Brandon. Yeah, wasn't he amazing? Um, uh, he, he really a typical talk, physician. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't talk like most of our colleagues. Um, yeah, I loved the phrase that that he used, uh, the concept of open to the unbidden. Um, I think about that uh, popular Christian song, "Your Will Be Done," mm -hmm. and you know, you sort of think, "Your will be done," to the degree that it agrees with my plans. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Other than that, not so much. But am I really open to to anything that comes? Uh, I love that concept. And then he used a phrase, uh, seek depth, avoid superficiality. Uh, that belongs on a retreat t-shirt somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love that phrase. I mean, how much of our lives are spent with the superficial, the things that simply don't matter, um, and to avoid those things and seek depth? And then finally, kind of related to seeking depth, the most important things at the end of it all is our relationships. And he even used that as a common definition of personhood, the idea that we have relationships and that makes us people. Yes. And I think he pretty well, without saying it explicitly, says that autonomy is really a myth. We really depend on each other in our relationships. Yeah, I like that, that concept because the autonomy thing says to a degree – I'm only valuable to the extent that I can do things. On my own. If I, if I lose the, the ability to do those things, am I somehow less valuable as a person? We know as, as Catholics, no, that's not true. But yet the secular world, the media want to say yes, all too often. And all you listeners are valuable, not just because you listened to this, but we're glad you did. And if you want to listen to other episodes, you can do so on our website, drdoctor.org. Just click on episode archive at the top where you can search over 290 episodes by topic or guest. And relevant to this episode, images, if you want to watch <laughs> our podcast on video, just click on the YouTube link near the top of the homepage at drdoctor.org. Moreover, if you have a question or something you'd like us to talk about, we'd love to hear from you. Click on the button that says submit a question. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And this is Dr. Chris Stroud. We're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor.